Hey, so uh, our next guest, by the way, from the New York area, so he's going to destroy us with his Yankee takes. Uh, he's like Vinny Chase from Entourage. I've been following Umberto Gonzalez since, <laughs> I don't know, man, like 2008, <laughs> nine, whenever he was starting with Latino Film Review. It's been a long time. What's going on, El Mayimbe? How you doing? Thank you for having me on, man. I hey, so uh, I've, I've been bragging about you for a while. Oh, you have you. broken I, – I, I, I would love for you to go through some of the things you have broken – but, I mean, the Keaton thing you just had the other day, I mean, left and right, you are on top of it when it comes to breaking superhero stories and just movie stories in general. Yeah, no, it's, uh, the thing with superhero movies, I and I think it's what's made me stand out from the crowd, is that I approach it as a fan. Like, me as a fan, what would I want to see or want to know? Like, I have this incessant desire to know every little detail, even spoilers sometimes. So that's always motivated, you know, and – seeing how these companies work and how they program their movies and they come up with their slates, I kind of get like a 10, I kind of get a feel because most of them are using the comic books, some of the best stories that they've printed as blueprints. Okay. It doesn't mean that they're literal translations. So you can see, okay, if they're doing, let's say the Michael Keaton thing. Okay. Uh, they're doing loosely based on the flashpoint storyline, like they just did on TV. Okay. Then who's going to be their Batman. So there was a rumor that there was going to be a Thomas Wayne appearance with Jeffrey Dean Morgan. But during their development meetings inside of DC, it evolved. Why don't we do this instead? Why don't we try to ask Michael Keaton to come back? And then that's how I found out about it, like early on in the process. And it was nerve wracking because it's been to sit on something like this right before it breaks. You're always concerned that a competitor is going to break it or whatnot. But, uh, yeah, and full disclosure, I'm a Met fan. I'm not a Yankee fan. Okay. So. All right. So we don't have anything to worry about with you. There's nothing to root about oh, right oh, now. Oh, oh. How are you going to go there, man? Leave my Mets alone, yeah. man. I hope Halo and A-Rod buy it, man. You know, so. Man, uh, it, it's so cool. Um, you know, Let's specifically stick on the Michael Keaton story and sure. him being in the flash with Ezra Miller. You right. broke that. That There's a chance, yeah. right? There's Batman right there. I've got a Batman statue in my living room. Love Batman. David Nunez was wearing a Batman t-shirt last broadcast. So we're all right. fans. Mm -hmm. And, you know, one of the things about, you know, go back, going back to the Spider-Man movies and then Iron Man launching the Avengers universe, it was almost, it almost felt like it was watered down, right? Like the general public was not ready for the multiverse, uh, the multiverse setting. So now that DC is doing it and they've done it with the flash on CW, were you surprised that they're taking it mainstream because it is such a confusing plot? That's been the thing. Like originally in my story, the multiverse explainer was a lot longer. So me and the editors condensed it down. So like people who don't read comics to make it accessible to general audiences. But it's a brilliant concept because we the newest thing in superhero movies, I feel, is now going to be the multiverse wars. Begun the Multiverse Wars has, as Yoda would say. So basically, DC's out the gate first. Marvel's doing something similarly that I'm tracking. I'm not ready to talk about it just yet, but think about it. What, what actors in the last 20, 30 years in Marvel movies could they bring back to like come into an MCU movie, you see? So now there's an arms race between these two studios. So DC's out the gate first, you know? But uh, yeah, Keaton... It's, it's amazing. I remember like yesterday, I was 15 when the Keaton movie came out. I went to the opening night on, the, on that weekend. I went to a couple of screenings. I put up something on my, on my Twitter the day the Keaton story. I, I went to a screening with, and I took a picture with a Batman. So uh, an actor in the Batman costume. And uh, I just got the 4K again recently, was revisiting all those documentaries. So the multiverse idea gives them the opportunity to bring somebody like Keaton back. We find out what he's been up to 30 years later. It perhaps gives him an opportunity to reintroduce Michelle Pfeiffer as Catwoman, basically. And for sake of conversation, you know, if I wish Christopher Reeve was still alive, he could come back as like a kingdom come Superman. That's basically the concept of the multiverse. Basically, all these universes exist under one umbrella. So DC has been heading in that direction. They've been planting the seeds. Like you saw in the CW show with the Flash, that was a hot scene. Everyone saw that, and then they have their own little Comic Con thing that's coming in in, in August. So they're calling it the Multiverse as well. You know, the Insiderverse, uh, the DC fandom and stuff. So it's like it's it's a very clever idea and something. And they have they started to think outside the box. Warner Brothers are very traditional company and a very traditional and old school in the way they do things. So they have some forward thinking executives that are not like. 
glued to the material and think outside the box, what would our competitor do? So basically something like Keaton coming back to play Batman, but much older, is something Kevin Feige would probably do if he was running DC. So, yeah. So you said something. I'm just going to talk out loud. Sure. 20, 30 years, Raheel. This, we're having a private chat right now. Just Raheel. Sure. Umberto's not involved in Toby Maguire? I mean, who are we thinking about in the last 20 years that it t- makes total sense to bring the Spider-Verse, right? Um, and, and and I'm just saying, it just in my mind, it makes sense. But I'm I, not checked, gonna... I checked on Toby Maguire, and apparently that rumor's been out there for a while now, and both Marvel and Sony shot it down. And, oh, you know, you're not, it's inaccurate and stuff, but where there's, in my experience, where there's smoke, there's fire. There's one thing saying that it's not accurate. It's another thing to say that it's not true. Ooh. Two different things. So okay. if Toby Maguire comes back, will it be the emo Spider-Man from <laughs> Spider-Man 3? Because if that happens, oh, no. Berto, I'm in. I'm in on if you got the hair again, everything. I'm still <laughs> in. Ooh, that was let, crazy. Me, let me offer this up to David, okay? You get sure. you, you get one cameo, let's say five years from now. All right. Yep. It's Iron Man, Tony Stark coming back, or Christian Bale's Batman coming back somehow. Easily. Okay. I know that Umberto's a big Ben Affleck, Bat Bruce Wayne. I'm a Christian Bale Batman. Other than the voice. I'm Batman. I like the, other than that, I, I think Christian RB. Bale. He's my Batman. So I would say without a doubt it would be Christian Bale. Uh but look, Robert Downey Jr., nobody has played a part better. I mean, that part was made for as Tony Stark. Mm-hmm. Um, as big as a Batman fan as I am, like Ben Affleck did it for me. His suit. He, he was a complicated Bruce Wayne. He was violent. Like that warehouse scene is one of the best action oh, scenes yeah. in my opinion of all time. I don't get tired seeing that. The only tragedy there is like I wish they made a Batman film before they made Batman be Superman because yeah. I think he'd be in a different position. But I think he was he was awesome. He was the Batman that I grew up reading in the 80s, a brutal, violent brawler who broke bones. But to answer your question, hands down, Robert Downey Jr., he's the biggest box office star perhaps of the last 10, 15 years. So... It's it's a no, you know people everyone and their mother knows that he was Tony Stark that he was an Endgame and they would go see that over Bale. Bale was a good Batman. I hated the suit though. Ben Affleck's suit was perfect with the knuckle attachments and and the black and the gray. And it, it, yeah, that's what different. But it's got to be you know it's got to be easily Robert Downey Jr. Umberto, Robert. help me uh, when, when we're talking about Affleck. I thought he was great in Batman versus Superman. He was great in this little miniature part in Suicide Squad. My problem with him, and I'm sure this is a Josh Whedon thing, is they made him a punk in Justice League. Like, that's not – like, he didn't want to be the leader. He just, okay, I'm just so sad. That's not Bruce Wayne. Like, I, I don't know. I just felt like that version of Bruce bothered me. Yeah, no, it bothered me too. He phoned it in. He was – he was you know, by the time they were shooting that, BVS was getting killed with reviews and stuff. It, it You know, he, 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 he – as we all know, he had a – a drinking problem it got him back off he fell off the wagon because of it and stuff and he went through a lot of personal issues um but he he, he put on some weight as well he you could tell it's painful to watch i only i haven't seen it since because you know he wasn't into it anymore he was just phoning it in and he wanted out like he just wanted out of the suit wanted out of the role and just go back to making movies that get him oscars quite frankly all right so let's talk about your journey because david was telling me beforehand this is so cool let's start with the professional side how did you get started in this? Because this is a dream job for so many people. And let's not get it wrong. Like we we are working in dream jobs as well. Nuno is, uh, and I'm here as well. Um, how did you get started professionally? Because your career path is so interesting. Oh, thank you. I appreciate that. Uh, basically, I moved to Hollywood about 20 years ago. And I, was, I became bicoastal. So then my introduction into the business, uh, I used to work with a film director who got, I used, I have a production background. I started, I graduated from film school and then literally the next day started working film sets and productions in the mid to late nineties. And you can make good money back then because music video budgets were in the millions. Now they're lucky if they even get four or five figures as a budget. So I was working production and stuff constantly. And then uh, under the Giuliani administration, there was a threat of an actor strike. So in April of 2000, my last job was for Iñárritu, Alejandro González Iñárritu. This is before he was Iñárritu, uh, like we know him today. He was directing a Quaker State commercial. And I was one of the only few people who were bilingual working production in those days. And I saw him work, and we talked, and he gave me some great advice. So when the strike didn't happen with the unions, there was a pseudo-strike because everybody thought the strike was going to happen. 
they got all this work together and then it didn't happen. So that I had some time to think of a next move. So I hooked up with a film director. He made a movie in October of 2000 for like 30 days. Uh, the movie was called Empire, uh, directed by Frank Reyes. And then 9-11, uh, you know, so he's posting the movie. Then 9-11 happened. He flew out the day before to try to sell the movie. And then 9-11 happens. The business goes quiet for a bit. And then uh, Training Day comes out. Training Day then opens the urban film market. It's the number one film. So then his film gets selected to go to Sundance in the uh, – in the winter of 2002, that was like 18 years ago. So basically he calls me, we're going to Sundance. So basically I had like an entourage-esque kind of entry into the business. I was like somewhat, I was a bit of Eric. I was a bit of turtle. I was a bit of dry drum. I did it. I was like a dude, a dude. So basically right. He sold the movie after Sundance in May of 2002. And then Universal was going to release it theatrically in December of 2002. So in November of 2002, I'm still someone out of the business. He asked, hey, what are you doing over a weekend? He's like, what are you doing? Why don't you come out with me to Hollywood and work with me? So I'm like, okay, cool. So that was November 6, 2002. We come from New York. We get to the airport. There's like with the signs with our names and stuff. And we go right to the premiere of Eminem's 8 Mile. Because 8 Mile had the commer had the trailer of my buddy's movie right playing in front of that. And eight mile was the number one movie that weekend. Cause everybody wanted to see the Eminem film. So as I worked with him, I started meeting a lot of people and stuff. So in the early late nineties, early two thousands websites, like Amy cool news, dark horizons, uh, Corona's coming attractions. There was a lot of gossip with all these movie sites and they started coming into their own, breaking all these stories. So I would hear a lot of scoops and stuff. Uh, I would hear a lot of information. So it was the cool thing to like submit information. And then uh, one day on any, on the homepage of Inco News, there was the first ever picture of Tobey Maguire chasing a bus in Spider-Man, the first Spider-Man movie. It's the, technically the first still. So it says, Latino Review breaks this site, uh, breaks this uh, story, Tobey Maguire. So, oh, Latino Review. So I, you know, I started following this guy, and his site is headquartered in Queens. Okay, he's from Queens. He's Latino from Queens. I'm Latino from Queens. So we, we, we kind of hooked up, and I started sending him information. And then we just decided to work together. And then uh, I think my first superhero story that was a first accredited one was uh, Tim Story directing directing uh, the Fantastic Four movie. Oh, wow. So I, I broke that. Uh, Peyton Reed, who directed Ant-Man, the Ant-Man movies, he was one of the contenders for that movie at the time. And uh, he clearly remembers being in contention for that. So then it... Uh, superhero movie news was still in its infancy. Back in those days, you'd be lucky if one movie happens a year. Now it's like a daily cottage industry. You've got all these sites and even the Hollywood trades covering breaking superhero news like, like anything else. It's incredible. But I was in very early on. And then uh, Jeffrey Boucher was, I consider, the first fanboy newsman, the first superhero movie news reporter. Um, he covered, for the LA Times, he covered uh, the basically Nolan's movies. Nolan's, Nolan loved him. He would give him exclusives. He would give him interviews and stuff. So he became one of the first guys. And Boris Kidd at The Hollywood Reporter became the second one. He would he he was a fan-centric reporter, and he would break stuff over at Hollywood Reporter. Uh, and then, yeah, Variety, too. Mark Grazer would break stuff back in those days. So basically, I just started getting all this information. I would build sources and stuff. Latino Review became much more popular, and then I started scooping and working with them full time. And then, uh, yeah, time flew, and then he sold the site. I decided to try to strike out on my own. You know, it was a very, you know, uh, scary, scary thought. But in that time, I broke. We broke a lot of big stories. CNN started paying attention to us. They gave us our first profile, like in 08, 09. It's around there somewhere. Uh, Kelvin broke, I think, the casting of Superman uh, back in those days. Uh, Brandon Ralph Superman. That was that was that wasn't a Hollywood trade story. That was ours. Um, there's so many that I could track, but on the superior, I mean, I remember when Ben Affleck got cast as Batman because earlier in the day I was teasing on social media, got a big scoop and stuff. So basically, I broke Bradley Cooper's casting as Rocket Raccoon in the Guardians of the Galaxy movies. So a publicist from Warner's reached out to me, "What do you got? You got something big?" So they thought I had that. 
They thought I had Ben Affleck as Batman, so they put out the press release maybe an hour or two later. Buried my scoop. Nobody cared that Vladimir Putin was oh. playing this, this, this rocket raccoon. And it was all about Ben Affleck's Batman. It was August of 2013. And I was crushed. I was heartbroken. I was like, that's great news. It's cool. But you buried my scoop. You couldn't wait like another day. So, yeah. And then I launched Heroic Hollywood five years ago in the summer of 2015. I started breaking stuff left and right. I was a little bit into the spoiler business back then because that's the stuff that would traffic. I'm out of the spoiler business now because... Thank you. <laughs> so it's not cool. But, um, yeah, and then uh, Colin Trevorrow. The funny thing is there was this director who was supposed to direct the Star Wars movies, Colin Trevorrow. I broke that. And then I broke when he left the project. Like So it came full circle. That was the biggest until then. So basically... A year later, after launching Heroic Hollywood, I got an email from an editor at The Wrap. And it's like, I thought it was a joke. I was like, mm, you know, okay, they, they, you know, they do know I have a website, right? So then a week later, the, the deputy editor reaches out to me, who's now the executive editor. So I was like, you know what? I got nothing to lose. So I told him, listen, when I come back from Comic-Con, let's talk. So I met the, the editor-in-chief at that time, the executive editor, Tim Malloy, who's also a big comic book reading fanboy like me. We went to uh, a, a breakfast joint in Hollywood, and we we talked for hours. We started working and stuff. I mean, I mean, we started like fanboying what he read, what I read, what he collected. Like he legitimate like I, another fellow geek my age in his mid forties who goes to the comic book store still to read. So basically, I read him, and then I met the deputy, and then they put me in front of the boss, Sharon Waxman, and the meeting was only five minutes. I know who you are. I know you hit major home runs. You break scoops. I want you to break them here. And we'll help you with your business on the side. You could do both. So basically, I break all my scoops at the wrap, but then I have uh, my I have a staff installed on Heroic Hollywood, and it's you know I'm basically an absentee landlord, and those guys just do a great job running running the site. And so if I break a story, they'll usually have it up within three to five minutes. So yeah, give them the heads up or whatnot. But it's been it's it's been a crazy ride. It's been a wild ride. So it's like the the one thing though, it's like. As a fan, I've always wanted to break a Batman. So I was completely out of the Batman casting of Robert Pattinson because a lot of times there's a lot, one of the things that are popular now with these kids is fan art. So they would put a lot of fan art there. So I, there was early on before he got cast, it was fan art of, uh, of Robert Pattinson in Batman suit. And me personally, I wouldn't believe, I couldn't believe it that he could be a Batman. Like, get, get out of here. No, he, no, I don't think so. I, so guys, look, it's going to be patents and it's going to be, no, it's not. You're just telling me because you saw some fan art on Instagram and you're going to tell me that this guy's going to be Batman. And then lo and behold, I'm picking up my girlfriend at the airport and in comes the story. Robert Pattinson cast oh. Batman. Oh my God. So it was my own self-denial. It's my own fault. I didn't even <laughs> investigate it. I didn't even brought, entertain the thought that this guy could be Batman. So it taught me one of the crazy, biggest lessons of my career is the crazier it sounds, the most likely true it probably is. You know, So it doesn't matter what you think. You know, if some if 20 people are telling you something, you're probably wrong and you should listen to the 20. Mm -hmm. But, uh, but, but Keaton, you know, so basically I consider him Pattinson's the millennial Batman. But Keaton, come on, I'm, let me point right over there. Keaton's Batman, that's the Batman of my generation, Generation X Batman. So it finally happened, you know, and uh, it, it, it was nerve wracking a week ago just to get that story out. It, I could lose it any minute and I almost did lose it to a competitor. But people, there, there are a lot of other up and coming scoopers that are building good sources and they hear information. So I, was, I started seeing the memes on Twitter, like the hints getting out of Keaton and stuff. And they, oh my God, I got to go. So basically, we pulled the trigger and I was literally five, 10 minutes away from losing that story. Wow. For a competitor. You know, so, uh, and it, it came down to the wire. And then, and then I took off because the stress and the cortisol and the hormone levels were like mm -hmm. going crazy like on a big story, because I knew how big it would be. And then Joel Schumacher died. Oh, I'm yeah. Like, oh, my God. No way. You know, so. But Same it, day, right? That he, he, the news was reported an hour before I broke it. But oh, the wow. thing is, I would have lost it anyway. You know, so my mother, the thing, the wild thing is, Batman came, the next day was my mother's birthday, June 23rd. June 23rd in 89 is when Batman was released. So I was thinking, okay, I might break it for my mother's birthday as a birthday gift to her, a movie that I fell in love with that opened the superhero movie arena in 89. But I did it the day before, so it counts. It's the week of. So <laughs> yeah, it still counts. It's the week of. But yeah, no, it's been it's been an amazing career. 
I feel very blessed to do what I do. I, I get paid to wake up and find out who's playing, what actors are playing superhero movies or what stories are coming. And it's it's the great, in my opinion, I'm sure sports writers would disagree with me, but I think the superhero beat is the best beat in the world. Period. Oh, absolutely. You don't want to be the sports writer beat, especially baseball. No. Right? <laughs> you have to have the hey, worst one. Uh Umberto, um, there's a couple things I, I know we've had you for a long time, so I apologize. There's two no, other no. things I want to get into. Uh, so we, we heard about your rise in the business, but when did you become Arnold Schwarzenegger, bro? Because uh, I saw you posted some muscle pics recently. Like I'm like an Instagram uh, model now. That's um, a year ago. <laughs> but, but you had a, a real scary part of your life a few years back. Um, in, in, if you can open up about how that really transformed you. Basically, I caught cancer. Like I've always been a jock, played school, played sports in high school. Like you know, and I and at 15, I always pumped iron because when you want to play football, you gotta you're gonna have to lift, you know. And there's no choice about. It. So there was a competition who at in those days in junior varsity who could bench 150 pounds the most. Now it's a warm up set. So it's a habit that I built. I fell in love with it. You know, I'm a big guy. I'm responsive to it and stuff. And basically, high school into my 20s, I, I started working out, and I was always somewhat physically active. So. And I'm not scared of doctors. There's a lot of machismo mentality. Like if someone's feeling something, they refuse to see a doctor because they think they're mentally strong. That's not how cancer works. Cancer will beat down the biggest tough guy in the world, no matter what. So I feel something weird doing cardio like in 2012. And basically, long story short, uh, I had a what's called, as we get older, we get masses. you know. And I had a mass on my one of my adrenal glands. It was benign. And it's okay, we're gonna have to monitor this, come back in a year. So I came back in a year and it, and it got big. So instead of like doing a biopsy, let's just let's just have let's do let's have surgery pre preventatively and uh let's get rid of it. So they took it out and they removed the adrenal gland with it, and we found out after pathology that it, it became met it metastasized. And it was on the way it was growing and how fast it grew, it would have killed me before my 40, my 40th birthday. So when I was told that. You know, I just decided to change my life. You know, I just I, it, it gave me I was always a confident guy, but it, it, it lit a fire in my butt. It made me more ambitious. It's like I'm, I got a second chance of life. I'm going to make the most of it. So basically, that's one of the reasons I, I, I launched my own outlet um, to work at the, the major trades. That was another opportunity I couldn't say no to. So but the working out thing, um, I've always been like an alpha geek. I'm the guy in the football locker room that was always reading the comic books. That's me. So I was a hybrid, you know, that's why I like Zack Snyder's director, because he could be a nerd and he could be a doc at the same time. So there's that special geek where you're cool with all the nerd kids, but you're also cool with all the jocks. You're but you're right there, a moderate in the middle. So what happened was um, I made a decision to lose weight and take better care of myself health wise. So then I, you know, I hired trainers like I wanted to get jacked, like I wanted to hire a trainer and he cleaned up my diet. This was like two years ago and I got into, and I got into condition. I learned my body. And then uh, the year after I hired an even bigger trainer who was a little bit more tougher, but he was more flexible in diet. And we, we, and I just got completely jacked for about a year ago. And then when COVID hit, I lost all the gains, man. They <laughs> I haven't, I haven't touched a barbell in over six months because even though gold, I live here in the Venice area in California and gold is literally like a mile away from me. I, I drive there every morning, but it's not healthy to go there right now mm -hmm. with all this COVID stuff. But I do cardio like so I got, you know, as a lot of bodybuilders have on season, like when they get all jack. And then there's the off season, the fall where they put on some weight, they take off for a little while, let the body heal and recover. So I had a very good off season. And then uh, I had and I just I, I put on the quarantine 15 before the quarantine. So then I just decided to do cardio and, and lose all the body fat and then get my body fat down back to like almost single digits. So when the gyms reopen, when, once there's a vaccine or there's not an incident, I'll return. And then the weight I put back on will be muscle. But the way I looked last year, I don't look like that right now. You know, so a hey, lot of that. Yeah. You mentioned uh, Snyder. So the other huge news from a couple of weeks back, the Snyder Cut's coming. I know you had a big thing on it recently. Uh, I watched, you know, uh, every second of it. Uh, talk to me about how you think it's going to unfold, because I, you know, I think the super super fan and a lot of us, we'd like to see them maybe build on that universe. But I, I think this might be a one and done, right? It's it's take trust me on this one. It is one and done. Basically, HBO Max needs content. 
they see this huge fan base, which I they they the fact that they held it down for like two, three years, being persistent, doing flybys, having rallies, dating billboards in Times Square at Comic Con, much respect to them. The executives at HBO Max took note as like maybe we should do something here. So basically they they're just gonna the Snyder Cut exists, but it's just not finished. So now it's going to take a year of all this post-production and special effects to finish his story. Like he originally planned to do three movies. Okay. Now he has to condense them into one with what he has. So basically dark side is a villain, uh, scenes that were, were shifted and stuff. So he's getting an opportunity to, uh, to finish his movie. And then that's it because DC wants to move forward. You know, it, it's, you know, Snyder had a shot and it didn't work out with them and, but he's getting he's getting the rarest of opportunities to finish his cut, and uh, and then that's it, you know. The, but the film unit, like they're going in different directions. Like as much as I would love to see Ben Affleck return for Batman, like in a movie or even a TV show, maybe it'll happen in a couple of years. Maybe he'll have a change of heart and change of mind. But right now, that's not going to happen. But it's indeed he basically. I don't. I think they're going to release it in a couple of parts sometime next year once they're done, like a six a four to six episode miniseries, and then maybe do it as one big movie. But uh, yeah, they 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 all do they do their voiceovers, their ADR works, special effects, and then they release it, and then yeah, DC proper moves forward. But the the multiverse allows the Snyder Cut to exist. If you think about it, it's just in a different universe, mm. the Snyderverse. But uh, yeah, no people, and there's always a lot. Of, unfortunately, a lot of what I also do is shoot down a lot of fake news and rumors because something will get sh something will catch on with fire. And people swear it's gospel, like the Thomas Wayne incident with Flashpoint. People are like, but what's going to happen with Jeffrey D. Morgan and and, and uh, Thomas Wayne? But you guys don't understand that conversation evolved into what became Keaton. That guy's not in the script. That guy's not hasn't been in the script for years. That actor hasn't even been approached yet. People swore it was happening. So it's like, no, it's not. And I got to shut it down. Hollywood Reporter just did a newsletter on Friday saying, listen, Thomas Wayne is not in the script. He hasn't been in it as well. Just backing up what I've been saying. So yeah, that's uh, that's another thing with with the job. So with the accent, with the advent of social media, someone can make something up, and a lot of other like fake news sites pick it up, and it spreads like wildfire. Yeah, that's the danger what, of social media. So what's the timeline right now for the DC universe? Is it Wonder Woman next, and then the Snyder Cut, and then Flash? Well, what, Wonder Woman. Wow, uh, they come out with Wonder Woman. They're in production. Um, they're getting gearing back to go into production on on Batman. They they got seven weeks in the can. They got another eleven weeks to go. So once Batman wraps, okay, those sound stages in London turn into the sets for the Flash. Mm. So they're gonna shoot the Flash next. Uh, they have to make Shazam two. They have to do Black Adam, uh, and then Aquaman two. So they're booked for the next two three years, and then they gotta figure out what to do with Superman. However, here's a cool tip. Uh, basically, the Flash movie will set everything straight, and the Justice League will be somewhat rebooted. Okay, Ooh. so yeah, so the Justice League, the Justice League, it's going to set the timeline proper for the DC universe going forward. So, from what I'm thinking, from what I hear so far, is that Michael Keaton might be the Batman of the new of the Justice League going forward with Gal Gadot or. Uh, with Wonder Woman, Aquaman, uh, The Flash, and Cyborg. And whoa, whoa, whoa. Keaton's going to be the Batman in that? He's I 200. Think so. I think so. Think about it. It's like a mod it's like a kingdom. Come they need a the Justice League needs a Batman. Okay. The Justice League needs a Batman. They were toying around originally with Robert Pattinson coming in at the end to for in the in the Flash movie, but they they figured there was just too much, there was too much uh confusion it would confuse too many people you know that wait a minute what's this batman doing if you guys have a ben affleck batman you see what i'm saying but a batman from a different timeline in in the current timeline that's a little bit more accessible so the flash will explain all that does that bring uh, open up the door for batman beyond guy tim what's his name um tim, tim Larry mcginnis uh the hollywood yeah. reporter reported something along i i mean that's what it sounds like to me i mean michael keaton will be 69 when he's shooting the role so basically if he wanted to mentor like Batgirl, they, they you know, if he wanted, right. that could be like the Batman Beyond. So from what I understand, they're going to try to make him the Nick Fury of the DCU going forward, where he's this older, wiser, grizzled Batman, and he mentors maybe a Batgirl, and he's probably the guy 
on on the current on the current Justice League. Exciting and stuff. We'll, and then we'll have Pattinson's world over here, which isn't connected to uh, Joaquin Phoenix's Joker per se, but it could be. It could be, yeah. Theoretically, they got to convince Joaquin and throw him a lot of money to do it. But right. theoretically, yeah. So maybe Pattinson's Batman could meet Joaquin Phoenix's Joker. The multiverse gives them that opportunity to do that. Sure. Yeah. Man, wow. exciting stuff, man. Yeah, I, absolutely. I think I, we just I, I yeah. excited for this stuff every day. Oh my god, that's so cool. Like I'm a fan first before I'm a journalist. So and that's what's helped, that's what's guided mm -hmm. me my entire career. Like, nah, that might work, that might not. Nah, I don't know. You know, so but now we're in the superhero movie world. Every studio wants to get all this IP out. We got Marvel, we got Sony, you got DC, you got independent producers making stuff out there too. Lions get everybody's trying to get into this into this IP business of superhero movies. Well, this is, we could do this all day. So, uh, Umberto, we appreciate your time, man. You, you and I have been going back and forth for years, so I, I appreciate you joining us. We're heels just as big as a superhero uh, fan as I am. So this has been fun. And, you know, next time I'm in L.A., we'll, we'll link up. Absolutely. Thank you for having me on, David and Rahil. I appreciate Thank it. Thank you so you much, Umberto. Thank Pleasure you very much. You, man. That was wow. awesome, man. I've uh, he's, I've been telling you for a while. I've been wanting to get him on the show just because, hey, he's great. He's awesome on camera, right? B, he knows his stuff better than anybody. Uh, and C, he's just got an amazing, I mean, his hustle um, is just, it's like, it's fresh when somebody's been doing it for 20 years and they're still as hungry as they were back in the day. So uh, I got a lot of respect for 